thank you for coming. It's uh, genuinely been an inspiring slash emotional morning. Uh, being here, I um, it's also amazing people speak today. And I'm here because Deborah Kid came to visit my school about a year ago. And we bumped into each other in the corridor. And we had about 20 minute chat. Uh, and then she got in touch on Twitter and asked me to come and speak about my expertise. And I thought, I don't have any expertise, so I'm just, <laughs> it's a bit of a worry about that. Um, so I'm just going to talk about myself and my journey I've been on. And some of the work that's been going on at School 21 over the last uh, five years. Um, I put these two questions up uh, earlier um, because some of the criticisms of project-based learning for those you know, who are interested in this sort of thing is when I took the job, um, I became a history teacher at School 21. I wasn't interested in project-based learning. And I got offered the job to be head of project-based learning at the school. And the caveat I've got to start this talk with is I'm a skeptic of project-based learning, but I was when I took the job. And I still look at it through a critical lens. And some of the criticisms of project-based learning, which I think are perfectly valid, and I think they go too far one way sometimes, um, is that the base of skill is knowledge. And other, in other words, project-based learning is all about teaching uh, skill, but actually skill is just application knowledge. Um, some people say skill shouldn't be taught in school, it should be a knowledge-focused curriculum. Uh, some people say that it's important to teach knowledge because that's what creates a culture. And some people talk about this idea of memory and this whole movement of the education at the moment, all about getting teachers to move facts from short-term memory to long-term uh, memory. And it's that I wanted to start with. So these are the criticisms, and I have these in my head of all times. Um, and I thought I'd start off by thinking about these two questions. So what is your most powerful uh, vivid memory of school? And what has been your most powerful uh, learning experience? Um, and that's the school I went to when I was a kid. Uh, it's not been filtered to look depressing, it just is that grim. Uh, but it's a great school, it's a really good school. And I really had a great time in school. But the problem is, when I look back, I actually don't remember very much about school. And actually, what I do remember about is I was in a band. I played the drums in a band and I used to do rubbish gigs. Uh, and that started in school, and that's what I remember. And when I do these talks, I speak to certain groups of people, and I always say, what is your most vivid memory of school? And it falls into two camps, usually. Uh, the, first, the first camp are people who say, my very memory of school is getting in trouble. Um, they tend to be PE teachers or SLT, usually go in that, <laughs> in that category. And the other people say, my most vivid memory of school is in a drama performance, when I cook for some people uh, for the community, when I put on a, uh, a drama show, when I was in a musical, when I put on an art exhibition. And that was true of me. Um, and when they say, what has been your most powerful learning experience, is when they're immersed in a problem, in a, immersed in an environment. And I, I, was, I was in um, Alison Peacock's talk earlier, and they built, I don't know if anyone was in there, and they built this uh, Celtic mud hut thing, where they have their lessons in. <laughs> and I think that'll be a, quite a powerful learning experience for those kids, way more than if they were in the classroom. Uh, but my most powerful learning experience came after university, and I actually went to work in Japan. Um, my first job at uh, university working schools out there. And I learned so much about myself going out there. I didn't speak a word of Japanese. I was on an island where no one else spoke English. Uh, and I had to learn very quickly the culture and, and the system I was working. And I also then went to work in Shanghai, uh, just after that, in China. And I've talked about, uh, the reason I put these things up there is because these are models that are often used uh, in certain circles to say that we should focus on our knowledge curriculum just like these countries do. Well, I was in it. And I base my teaching around those <laughs> models still. I don't think they're not, I don't think they're, they're uh, completely exclusive to each other. Um, I then came back from Asia and I went to work in this community here um, as part of Teach First. It's in Hull, so I was in Yorkshire. Um, and I had a great time there and I worked with some absolutely amazing teachers and some amazing students. But I started to become a little bit disillusioned with education. Um, and these are sort of problems I sort of found about it, which was making me slightly question whether I should be a teacher or should move on to a different role. And the first one was this idea of motivation of students. I think if you read Daniel Pink's book about mastery, autonomy and purpose as being the driver of motivations in humans, schools do mastery really well. We focus on drilling the kids on the things they need to know. But there's very little autonomy, in my opinion, um, in education. And there's even less purpose 
and some people did really well, but very less, uh, little purpose. They were, it was incredibly exam focused, um, which I, I get the pressures of, I understand that, but it was at the expense of um, other things. And I heard Laura in the panel this morning talk about if you focus on exam, you leave something out. There's a really interesting article by a guy called Yong Zhao. He's an American author, and he wrote an article about this idea of side effects. So medicine's often used in education as a, as a thing to aspire to. But he's like, when you take a drug, it says on the, the packet, if you take this drug, it will cure your headache, but it might give you a sore, a sore stomach. And I think in education, we've gone too far down the route of going, this works for that, this works for that, this works for that, not thinking about the side effects these are having on the students. Um, I felt it was lacking authenticity. I felt I was te a history teacher, by the way. And I felt the kids just could not see or understand why on earth they were learning history. I understand that. And linked to that, they often say to me, what's the point? What's the point of this? And the only answer I could give was because they didn't get good results and they didn't get a job. And now I think about it, I go, how depressing is that, that school has become a trudge? <laughs> like, it's boring, you hate it, but you have to be here so you can get a result. And then the reward of that is a job. At the end of it, it just seemed, and in this community, in this community, it wasn't even a job. <laughs> so we were keeping them in school and, and saying, you've got these results. And they had nothing to go for. I, I sort of felt education has got to be more than this. Um, and so I uh, looked around and I found this school called School 21. It was a year old. It had been open September previously. Uh, so I joined when the, they had year seven, year eight. And I was attracted by this idea that they wanted to educate the head, the heart, and the hand of the children. So academics are going to be really important, of course they are, but rigorous, I want great exam results. However, we're, we're going to bear in mind that we also need to focus on the heart of the child, the character of the child, and making sure they feel and have the tools to cope. And finally, this idea of the hand, the doing. We want, we want kids to be making and immersed in building their craftsmanship um, skills as well. And some of the sort of phrases that we use in our school are, the vision is perhaps to create beautiful work which makes a difference to the world, which is one I buy into. And the one I like most, I think, is today matters. In other words, kids can do things, great things today. We don't have to wait till they're 30 and have their results and a job to do great things in the world. They can do it right now. Um, so that's why we do PBR at School 21. It answers some of these questions. So the first question was, students are capable of producing beautiful work. This is one of our exhibitions. We have these at the end of every school term. Every child in our school, at the end of each term, presents their work to the community. So every child has a stall, and they display their work, and then the community come in and question about it. It's work they're proud of, by the way. It's work they're proud of, by the way. And also, we try and make work that makes a difference to the world, that has a purpose. Um, and here's a good example of this. One of our English teachers at school, uh, she recently did a project, uh, a maths English project, and they wanted to um, investigate whether a proposed concrete factory and going to be built by our school was going to have an environmental impact. And the councillor said, no, well, it's fine. And the teacher, the maths teacher, didn't believe this, and they got their kids to spend a term researching the environmental impact and presenting a report to the council. It actually made BBC news. They wrote a letter to the BBC to get them to come into school. They did a big report on it. And actually, the, the factory was actually stopped. The planning mission was withdrawn from the school. I don't put it <laughs> entirely down to the kids. I think there's probably other factors in it. But they played a part in that, and I think... They're going to school thinking that education is not just a trudge through uh, subjects so they can pass the exam. They're seeing that education has a purpose. You learn things that so you can actually make a difference to the world. Um, I think it's important for memory. Another reason we project based learning is memory. Because, again, this is a big um, point of discussion at the moment. But, like I asked that question earlier, what do you remember from school? It's not the practice you did for hours and hours and hours. It's the big events you took part in, it's the, it's the, um, the shows and the musicals and exhibitions. Um, so this is a Cold War project that I was involved in. Um, I won't go into the details, uh, but it was an art history project. And the history had to look at the development of the Cold War. And the art made these massive caricature heads. And this was a performance we put on at Stratford Theatre Royal. Um, and the students had to tell the story of the Cold War through this thing. It's, it's more interesting than it sounds. Um, but the thing is, what it provided was, it put an emotional connection to a quite dry historical content. So making kids emotionally connected to the Tehran Conference of 1943 is quite a challenge, because it, it doesn't affect their lives in any way. But if you can make them believe that what they're doing with that content does affect their lives and does affect their community, perhaps they'll remember it more. 
And the final reason we do it, well, the second final reason we do it, is it provides motivation, I think, for knowledge massively. Uh, I've got two really dodgy pictures of me up there. Um, because I just wanted to highlight this as a, as a personal thing. I'm quite an intrinsically motivated guy. I'm a teacher and I know the theory about you know, education, how you learn. And two things I really want to do is to play the piano and to run a marathon. And I really want to do that. I'll take the marathon example. That's me in the Oxford half marathon. I want to run a half marathon in under two hours. And I really want to do it. And even, I lost it so much that before I, I stayed in the hotel last night, before I came here, and I booked a hotel that had a gym in it. So I was like, I'll get to Leeds, I'll put my running gear on, and I'll go for a run, because I want to do this half my own. Sadly, well not sadly, it was quite enjoyable, the hotel had a bar as well. <laughs> and so when I got to the hotel, very quickly my mind was drawn to the bar, <laughs> not to the gym. Um, and I think that's what, the reason is, I think, because I've not got a half marathon this week. I've not got a half marathon next week. I haven't got a half marathon next month. I'm not working towards anything. It's this drive I have in me, but it's not short term enough. And I think what we're asked, sometimes we ask kids to do is go, know your times tables, know your times tables. Why? Because in five years' time, you're going to have a test and this is important. And five years' time is half the child's life. If I said to you, right, guys, uh, you know, a bit of ages, but you're going to, you're going to set a test in your life again, and you've got to memorise all of this material for it, you wouldn't even look at it, you'd put it in a cupboard, and then maybe a week before, you'd go, oh, I've got a test, <laughs> and get out and try and learn it. And I think that's why in year 10, uh, if you're a secondary teacher, suddenly all those kids that have misbehaved for years, suddenly you go, oh, I've got to work now, because they can start seeing the purpose of why they're learning, it's for them. And I think what project-based learning does, is it puts purpose and motivation into key stage three, where there perhaps is Another thing was we wanted to uh, broaden that assessment, um, as many people do. Exams are important and we want great GCC results this year. However, I want GCC results to be part of the education outcome, not the whole educational outcome. So I had the, the panel this morning about the student that um, might get a G and that's a really, a really good achievement for that child. I think that should be part of the portfolio of work which they leave school with that they are proud of. And one way we're doing that is we bring the community and our experts in to assess our projects as well. And students all have a one-to-one -one, um, meeting with their teacher to talk through their learning at the end of each project. Uh, and I think that's an interesting way of doing assessment. I'll talk more about that later. Um, we haven't had results yet, I get them this year. Um, this is the Ofsted report that happened a couple of years ago. Um, and they were impressed by the project-based learning stuff. If that's a worry for you, it's not a worry for me, but yeah. Okay. Um, more interestingly for me, is we've just we our sixth form is about to open, and I got this email um, a couple of weeks ago now, and I was really proud of that. If I went to my proudest achievement in school, I think that was it, because the students that have chosen history and it's the, the most popular subject um, in the in the school for those that chose it, um, they could see the purpose of history way beyond it as a subject, and they sort of felt it as a way of um, solving injustices, which I, I was really quite proud of. And I think it's through the method we've used in our classrooms that they want to do that. So how do we do it? I suppose that's the, the next phase of this. Um, we have a, a, a checklist we use. I want to talk through all of these things. Um, but we think a good project has eight components to it. One, every project should have an essential question. Something that drives the project. Something that's bigger than a classroom. Preferably a problem that needs solving. Linked to that, it's a problem that needs solving for someone. So you're not working just for the teacher, you're working to solve a problem in the community or for someone. When I worked in Japan, um, I was really, uh, well, I didn't realise this until I came back to Britain actually. It seemed like the parents, the teacher and the student were all on the same side working, to, working against an examiner. And then when I came to Britain, it kind of felt like I was on the examiner's side and it was sometimes student versus me. And I think it's what it does is if you shift the learning and the outcome for someone else, suddenly you're on the same side as the kids. Suddenly it shifts the power dynamic in the classroom where we're all working together on a project for someone else, which I think is interesting. An end product which is uh, crafted, so we don't do many outcomes, but we do them well. And my uh, advice is there if you're doing this, 
start with the first draft very early on. Um, it's what a lot of teachers do, and I'll talk about this in a moment, I think, that I've seen, is they sort of go, right, before they write an essay, I've got to teach them this, then I've got to teach them this, then I've got to teach them this, then I've got to teach them this, and then they write an essay, they go, oh, they can't write an essay, they haven't been listening. And what I, what I found, when I said to them, you've got to write an essay in the first draft due next week, suddenly I was like, wow, they know a hell of a lot of stuff from primary school or from their own lives. And then through the lessons, I was able to work with them individually to build on their, their own essays, rather than assume a deficit the second they walked through my classroom that they couldn't do it until I talked about it. And we have since been content, which hopefully you'll see in a minute, and, and rigorous assessment. Another thing that I, I think has changed my teaching is this idea of transparency. And I think Stephen Turney talked about this a little bit. At the start of every project, every kid knows exactly where everything's going to happen and has all the resources to do that project. So if a child wants to, at the end of the lesson, they can go home if they're really interested, I carry on. They don't need me to tell them what to do. It's not me setting homework. They have everything there for them. And I always feel like I've failed in a lesson if they come in and say to me, so what are we doing today? Because I don't know how you can be independent if you walk into a door and you don't know what's actually going to happen in that classroom. And I think there's no other institution in the world where you have a job and you come in and you go, what, what's that? what are we doing today? What's my job today? Uh, you, you know, you have agency over that. Link to that student choice, I guess. Um, this is not do whatever you want. Uh, I think creativity comes through constraint. So just like the real world, we'll give them a design brief and um, constraints they have to work with it. Uh, but it's up to them and their group to figure out to solve the problem using those constraints. Again, I'll talk about it in a bit. And a grounding text. Um, we think every student should read a text alongside their project so they can learn to read. Read to learn. Uh, they can learn themselves, teach themselves. So this is a project idea. This is, this is the concrete example of it, I suppose. This is the, the, the test that's actually going to be sat. They're going to sit the test on uh, Tuesday next week from this project. So if I'm not here next year, that's probably, <laughs> probably why. <laughs> and you can ignore all of this and just you know, think about it again. Um, and it's the Edexcel uh, History A in Making the Modern World. And this course is about uh, the transformation of British society. Just looking at Britain between 59 and 79. And the point of this course is for students to understand, to engage with sources. And this is how I used to teach it. I used to lesson one, they come in, I go, right, let's learn about the economics in the 1960s, and maybe watch a video, read some sources. Uh, then, you know, for the assessments, I need to test if they've learned something. I'd say, right, pretend you're in the 1950s, uh, let's imagine you're back in time, and let's write a diary. And then they bring the books, then a week later I'd mark it and then they'd never do anything with it. Then lesson two, they'd come in. <laughs> I had no idea if they'd learned anything about the economy last time. They could have been on, you know, looking at the window the whole time. But I moved on and I went into immigration in the 1960s. And again, put them in categories, did an assessment at the end of it. It was very much sort of information activity AFL. Information activity AFL. Activity driven. Yeah, so it was a linear model of teaching. Um, in my opinion, it was, they can't do it until I've taught them these things, I'm going to build it. It was preemptive. Um, I would assume they couldn't do something until I told them how to do it. Everyone was stopping and starting at the same time. So activity one might start this to me now, activity two. Um, very surface level understanding of a topic. No authentic history. The books were marked sporadically because I was tired. I had loads of this to do. I had to plan next lesson, next lesson, next lesson. There was no redrafting of work. They wouldn't go back to their work ever again. Um, and it was most often me at the front of the class trying to motivate, motivate them to learn about the miners' strike in 1973 because it didn't matter them. So the only thing they had was I had, a, I had my motivation and a stick. I had the school behaviour policy and that was the only way they were motivated to learn it. Um, so we changed it when I went to this school. Uh, exactly the same content, exactly the same course, we tried to do it slightly differently. So we set up an essential question and the essential question was how can we as historians tell the untold stories of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And the end product was a documentary um, telling the oral history of East London. And we'd actually booked out the View Cinema in Westfield, the big shopping centre in the area. And we told them, the day I launched this project in September, I said, on December the 12th, your, perform your, your, your videos are on show in this, and I've already taken the invite out. So it's happening. And the authentic audience was, we opened it to the community, um, we opened it to the parents and the teachers, but more importantly, we invited all of the people that we interviewed for the project. So I was like, this has to be good because you know, if, you, if someone's given their time to come to school to talk to you and you've done a really bad job of showing that interview, 
it's going to be quite embarrassing for everyone involved. I put quite a bit of pressure on the kids in, in that sense. So we launched it. Um, yeah, the end product there, a five minute professional video clip. Um, I'm not going to show this, but before the project started over summer, me and the other institutes involved in this project, we actually made one ourselves. So just like uh, Stephen Turner was saying earlier, we had gone through the process and we knew what excellence should look like and we had gone through all the problems the kids might have gone through on the way and we showed them as the start that this is what we're aiming for. I won't show it, it's quite embarrassing. Um, and I told them what content we were going to cover. Of course it was all the GCSE content. I put all the resources on my website and Google Classroom. Um, and I told them what they need to do. Okay? We structured the session so I'll talk about it later actually. It's a carousel, but you'll see that too. So all everything's on Classroom, you can see that. Um, this is kind of how we viewed the planning of it. We had the shallow content that we thought most schools covered, um, which was just the key topics of the, the, the unit, followed by a multiple choice quiz, um, quiz, followed by a mock. So we still scheduled those in on our timelines. So the kids still got the same level of knowledge that they would have got in any other school. But we also then wanted them to work individually pairs to get some deep content about a particular area that interested them, or if they didn't have one, we just gave them one. Um, and that's how I broke it down. So yeah, assessed, you're going to have a mock at the end of this. We tracked them uh, in a very detailed way. It wasn't, it wasn't just this, get on with the project, we're never going to look at it again. And I'll tell you how I did that in a minute. Um, one thing we did was we put on, and the students organised this themselves uh, as part of the project, we put on coffee mornings where we invited the community who'd lived through that period to come in and tell their stories and filmed on iPads. Um, this one's an interesting picture because one of the students there, I won't say his name, uh, is not a particularly engaged student. And the day before this happened, we had a conversation and we were looking at how in the 1950s, um, often companies like TfL used to go to the Commonwealth countries and try and persuade people to come and work in Britain because there was a, a shortage of workers. And he came running to me, he was like, Mr. Pardo, Mr. Pardo, you're telling the truth. And I was like, what are you about? He was like, you're not lying to me. I was like, I know, what about like, that woman actually came over, I was like, I know, <laughs> like he thought history was like just something in the books that was sort of made up and he hadn't realised that people who was walking past in his, in his community had actually experienced that. And um, we went out into the community as well, um, we, had, we got in contact with the BBC who sent this guy, uh, who gave a very inspiring talk, as you can see from the students, uh, about... <laughs> It's how you guys look, to be fair. Don't laugh too hard. Uh, and he, he came in and he critiqued their work on three occasions. So he said, right, the first draft is in, in two weeks, and the BBC is going to, not, not, not the whole BBC, this guy from the BBC, is going to critique it. Um, and obviously it was rubbish, right? <laughs> of course, what they produced was terrible, as you can imagine. But I kind of expected that. It was meant to be terrible, because they get the critique, so they learn from it. And it wasn't me giving the critique, it was someone from outside who was an expert in the field giving the critique. So they wanted to work for him, not for me. Then they went away and redrafted and redrafted until by the end of it they were actually pretty good. Um, and we put, the, we put the show on the View Westfield and that was some people that we interviewed. Um, this is really quite nice because again I think hearing Alison Peacock speak earlier really reminded me of the importance of schools as part of a community and the impact we can have. Some of these people like, said to me afterwards that they didn't think young people cared about them and they said they'd never been to the cinema, in that, you know, they'd never been to this big shopping centre and they brought their, grandparents, uh, their grandchildren with them and stuff like that. It was a real occasion and it was really nice for them to see that I think. It was good for us to do something for the community there. So how the lessons look? Because we shifted the whole way of teaching this, basically we team taught it, it was me and uh, Rosie, his teacher there. And we had between us about 42 students. And basically, when they came to lesson, and Deborah came and visited the school while this was happening, and walked straight through it, I think this is why I'm here. Uh, so, so this is what you remember. Unless you invited the wrong person, different person maybe. Um, so the kids walked in, and they have a breakout space, and they knew every lesson what they were working towards. They were working towards a mock exam at the end, and then a series of deadlines on the way. And they just got on with it. So they had all the resources, and we set the tasks, not like laid out at the start, and they just came in and got on with the work. Or, they getting close to the deadline, they were in the mac room working on the documentaries. And it was up to them to decide which one they did. 
actually. We didn't, we didn't dictate them. And so what that freed me and Rosa to do was to do quite interesting stuff with the kids. So then we were able to say, Rosie was able to take out a group of 12 students and run a seminar with them, going in depth about their topic and really questioning them. Or, if we needed to, if, we'd done a, if we did a multiple choice quiz and we found out that half of the students didn't understand this topic, we could take those half of the students and put them in a room and teach them it. While the other half, who didn't know it, could carry on with their own work. In other words, we were getting rid of teaching for the average and actually personalising the teaching as much as possible. Linked to that, this is us giving one-to-one uh, -one feedback. Uh, it looks like an immigration control. <laughs> it's not a border control. But, um, that was there, so we didn't want to mark for a variety of reasons, but we wanted to mark with the students. So during the sessions while they were working, we'd just call the students up in quite a systematic way and go, what have you done today? And they'd have to tell us. And that's a great accountability measure because ev after a while, every student knew that three or four times each lesson, they were going to have to sit in front of a teacher and explain what they'd done and justify it. So over time, students really work quite hard because they know it's coming. I sort of think back to how I used to teach was everyone like this. They might not be picked up for weeks. For weeks and weeks and weeks. This is every single lesson <laughs> they're getting uh, checked. And also, again, it, it shifted the power balance a little bit. Because I think as teachers, sometimes what we do is we have all the power, don't we? Like, we see every student's book. And they only see their book or maybe their mate's book. So we know what excellence <laughs> looks like. And this kid might be working really, really hard, and we're just going, yeah, but, you know, you're that level because this guy, but they don't see that guy, you know what I mean? So what we tried to do was bring them up in groups as well and get all the books out and just sort of go, what do you like about this book? Let's discuss, let's discuss what it looks like. What's the purpose of this book? What's in it and why are we doing it? And let them sort of figure it out. Because students want to be good as well. But they, so if they see it, they just go, oh, that was why that, you know, I like that slide, I'm going to copy that. I think that's absolutely fine, that's good. Um, we did exam clinics if we needed to, close to the tests. We did masterclass sessions, basic, um, basic courses, community engagement. So it was quite a free model. Um, and it looked more like this. So instead of that linear model I was talking about earlier, the way we planned it was, right, there's a culminating event. And that was the, um, the day where we showed the, the, the films. Um, and then there's a series of benchmarks. Um, and that was either the guy from the BBC coming in to critique their documentary or a practice paper. And then during, between those things, the kids had a choice of what to do. They didn't have to just follow us as long as they were meeting those deadlines. Just a different way of thinking about how, how, how my classroom worked. Some more examples before I finish up. This is an example of, it's very early days, this actually. Um, this is the first year I've been in the school. And this is one of our assessment days. Um, so the student isn't writing a, a test about chemistry. And this is part of an art science project. They had to stand in front of the science teacher, an architect, and someone from another school, and talk about what they'd learned during that project. It wasn't written, it was, it was verbal. I did a revolutions project very early on, I won't talk about it too much. Um, but the way we assessed that one, where the students had to do a history drama performance about uh, the French or Russian Revolution. Um, and to assess that, there's me, the drama teacher, the director of the Almeida Theatre, the director of the local history association, and an immersive theatre actor. So they came in to assess the work. So it wasn't just like teacher, student, it, you know, I made a discussion about it. We sat around in a circle and discussed after each performance what was good and what could be done better next time. Uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, I was working on a, you know, we talk about learning, what's the point of learning knowledge. Um, this was a project I was working on with an art teacher again. And I wanted to do graphic novels exploring the World War II. And this group had the question, their essential question was, was America just in dropping the atomic bomb on well, Nagasaki? I lived in Nagasaki, so I was quite interested. And they had to sort of like answer that through a, a graphic novel. And I just got on Twitter and I tweeted, I was like, is there anyone in Britain that survived this white bomb? Just that curiosity. And within about 30 minutes, this woman got back to me. I, I, I was here. And she happened to live a bit further north, but she was happy to come in. She wanted to be involved in the school. So I was able to tell the students that the reason, you know, you're learning this knowledge because it's important, but you're going to have to have a seminar 
about whether America was just in dropping the atomic bomb on Japan with someone that survived the atomic bomb on Japan. So you need to know your stuff. You can't just turn up and, you know, not, I think it's a, a, a more interesting driver. So she ran that uh, seminar here. So my key learnings of this have been, I now think I ignore this inbuilt deficit view of education. Now I think the students don't come. Um, I think someone said this morning in the panel, again, it was really inspiring where they said, you know, it's a, a, child, a child has a book and pages have been filled before they've come to school and they fill it outside of school as well. So don't assume that when they walk into school, it's an empty book. Uh, a good example of that is, again, I asked them to write an essay. Uh, one of the essays I asked them to write was, um, was the Enlightenment the most important cause of the French Revolution? Silly so title, right? And I said, you've got a week. I want your first idea drafting. And this girl came to me, um, and she's quite, you know, she's a hardworking student. But you might not, not, you might not, you might not first expect her to, to do this. And her essay was about Rousseau and the social contract. And I was like, where did that come from? I was like, I've not taught you that. How, how, how dare you know it? Because <laughs> <No. laughs> I'm a teacher, so he just, I said, oh, my mum's doing an open university course on philosophy, and he sat down and planned it. And I was like, amazing. So I was able then to give her feedback, and her essay took a really philosophical slap. You know, some of the students came in, you know, as you might imagine, an essay written on this toilet paper, you know, <laughs> you know you put three lines. And that was why I said, right, you guys need help with structuring sentences, you know, like the typical PE paragraphs or whatever. Let's work on that with you. So you get to see the variety of kids when you, when you assess them straight away. I've started to rethink behaviour quite a lot. Um, I was lucky enough to be mentored by someone from High Tech High in America for my first two years at School 21. And sometimes he literally had to hold me back in the classroom. Because I was like, they're off task. They're off task. I was obsessed with it. I've been drilled to think that lessons were everyone on task. And he used to hold me, literally, because I was just going, he's like, watch them. Let's see what happens. He's like, have they met deadlines? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, surely they're on task then. He's like, think about you in school. Are you always on task? Like, do you wander off? We get a coffee sometimes? Do you come back? Is it, like, why do we have this idea that like, on task means doing work? Um, because you, know, you don't know what doing works looks like. You're off task, to me, might be on task for a student. It's a perception issue. That doesn't mean I don't think manners are really important. But I've started to rethink what I mean by behaviour. Uh, links that I think is engaging is not the same as fun. I, I, I've got no problem with kids having fun by that way. But I think some of the, the criticisms of project-based learning is it's all about fun. The kids just enjoy themselves. Like, and I think they've conflated engagement with enjoyment. And I suppose the best example of this, I was talking to someone the other week, and I said, if I get on a plane, I'm scared of flying, right? If I get on a plane, I don't really care if the pilot's having fun, but I do want to be quite engaged. <laughs> I don't mind if he's having fun, I hope he really enjoys his job, but at the very least I want him to be engaged. And I think what project-based learning can do, especially at Key Stage 3, is to push this engagement uh, down. And then finally, transparency and long-term planning. Again, I think for us, as we get older and go to university, whatever, when you go to a course, you usually get given a pack of all the things you need to read, of the essay deadlines, of when the exam is going to be, and then it's punctuated by a benchmark where you can have a seminar or a lecture or whatever. But it's up to you to start doing that. And I think every time we take that away from the child, we're making them quite dependent on us. Um, so I'd like to move away from that. That's the end of my talk. I was going to have... Maybe just a couple of questions if anyone wants any. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, fellow vision teacher. Okay. Um, with the dullest of topics, mm. do you do a project for, for even the dullest topics? Or so, is there any sort of <coughs> traditional, let's call it, style of teaching still going on? So I still have the traditional style of teaching as part of the project. So in that seminar, I'd take them out and just do some work with the kids, but it'd be a smaller group um, of kids rather than the whole class. Um, and I, 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 I sort of said this earlier, actually. I don't think this is the right way to teach. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's one right way of teaching. It's just a way I'm enjoying at the moment, and I think is working. If I thought it stopped working, I'd change it. And 
So, so an example of this actually was just after this project, we then started to look at the rise of Hitler uh, Union on the GCSE. And the kids came to me and went, can you just teach us? And I was like, why? We're just interested. I want to know it, and it's for my GCSE. And I was like, yeah, fine. So we just did, we just did what I would have done in my last school. We just taught the same. So I think it was on purpose, because they could start seeing why they, wanted to, why they were learning something, whereas perhaps they wouldn't have done with this particular unit. Okay. So, um, to follow up with that, really, in the sense that, um, because me and my wife, we, we do training in PBL, and the most frequent question we get is teachers saying, so much in the curriculum that I've got to cover. Now, you're, you're managing to do both. So, are there bits of the curriculum that you're just skipping over, or how are you doing that? And the, the second question I have, which also relates to your use of time, is you've got some great adult world connections. Yeah. Are you doing that, or is somebody at School 21 helping you? Okay, so to, I'll, I'll try and answer. The first part, yes, at Key Stage 3, we go into depth rather than breadth, that would say. Um, and some of the criticisms you get as a history teacher is sometimes you come and go, what, you haven't covered the peasants before? Like, how dare you? They're going to go out like, and I'm like, how, how long did you cover it for? Like, two lessons. Well, you haven't covered it either, have you? Because it's such an important historical topic. So yeah, at Key Stage 3, we go depth rather than breadth. At GCSE, the Key Stage 4 stuff, I think part of the problem made with running through the content is teachers basically plan their one hour block as the only slot of learning that can take place and then they get the curriculum and they break it down further and go well this lesson they have to do this, this lesson they have to do this, this oh I've got to run out of time now whereas if you just say to the kids like we've been doing listen you need to know this by end of three months like and here's where I'm going to talk to you about it and some kids, you find out, go, actually, they can finish that book in two weeks. It's really easy for them. And some really struggle with that. And they, then I can focus, you know, more one to one session on those. So I just don't think there's a... I get why people say it, but I think you have to... If you reimagine, like I say, what your view of education is, then it becomes quite... A, a no-brainer, in my opinion. Adult World Connections? Oh, Adult World Connections. So, we do have someone in the school now that does that, but the projects I was talking about here were not done. They, they were done before the, the person joined our school. Uh, it's what I found is, and again, I think someone said mentioned this earlier. How was it? Alison Peacock. Um, people really want to be involved in schools. <laughs> in fact, they're begging to be involved in schools, actually. And it's what we tend to do with people is, someone goes, oh, I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm a banker, I'm interested in talking about my role. And we go, great, here's an assembly. Yeah. Like, and you're sort of like, actually, I find this assembly is quite intimidating, and I work in a school. Imagine if you're a random person, actually, that's how you're used. Whereas, we've just, I, Twitter was the thing I used the most. Now, I'm doing this project, anyone interested, come in and meet me, and then we plan the project kind of together. So, I'm like, what skills do you have, and what do you want to do? And let's build you into it. And that's how it Looking at someone who works in the part of primary school. <laughs> no. no. Um, well, it's kind of interesting in our school because we're in all through school. Um, so the idea is eventually when we're full, which we're getting close to now, is you can join our school at the age of three years old and then leave at 18 um, if you want to. I think we, we don't have as much as we should do. So does it, does, does it go down any earlier than Key Stage 3? Yeah, so we've got a reception year one, year two, year three, and year four, and I think next year is our first year five. Okay, and they'll all do this kind 
Yeah, and it's really interesting. I think just sort of primary school teachers, I think the secondary teachers sometimes they're hard. Because again, that deficit model, uh, I've got this planned, I'm going to teach this. They don't know it. What have they been learning for five years? Do you know? Like, and there's no conversation about what they actually have been <laughs> learning about it. And I think what's been interesting in our school is, I didn't talk about this today, I could have done, but how we plan these projects. And we're going through a series of tunings ourselves of redrafting these projects. So before I delivered this project, I presented this to a, uh, a group of staff from all across the school, both primary and secondary range objects. They gave me critique on my project. I went away and redrafted, just like the kids do. Then I had another point where I had another meeting where I presented it again, and it went through like a quality control process. And one thing I really learned is having primary teachers come into secondary and help plan those projects. That link is so vital. I think that's the end of the session, so. Oh, sorry. Moving on from quality control to Yeah. How do you incorporate stuff like demonstrating for us, like if you were to be observed, for example, sorry, I'm speaking for an NQT point yeah. of view, so. Um, how do you demonstrate progress in a lesson and things like that with something like this? I'm, I'm lucky that I work in this particular environment where our SLT don't focus on those things. Um, it's what I would say, and when Ofsted came in actually, to be fair to them, they never once asked, can I see progress in this lesson? They sort of said to me, can, we show, can you give me the books and can I speak to the students? And I think if someone was observing me now, I'd say, the progress you're going to ask is speak to that person, <laughs> talk to the kid, because they, they will tell you what they've been learning and they will tell you what they've started, they'll tell you what they've done now. Um, and I think that's way more powerful than any sort of mini pleading. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>